Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us on this gorgeous day. Um, we are at a um, Humanities Research Center's Meet VCU Authors event with Jessica Henry Nelson. My name is Chris Shin. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, as well as the director of the Health Humanities Lab and the acting director of the Humanities Research Center for spring 2024, while Christina Stanchu is on a Fulbright in Canada. I'd like to thank the College of Humanities and Sciences, the amazing Ronnie Sisova, and the acting assistant director, Eli Costin, for their support and help promoting this event. The Humanities Research Center's Meet VCU Authors series invites faculty, students, and members of the Richmond community to come meet VCU authors as they talk about their recent publications and answer questions about their work. It's also a time of celebration, as we know that every book takes many years and a lot of hard work to complete. Our virtual events follow a more or less similar format. I'll introduce our guest, who will then speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions from the audience. You can post your questions during and after the talk using the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. I'm happy now to turn to introduce Jessica Henry Nelson, who will be discussing her award-winning book, A Memoir in Essays, and the winner of the 2022 AWP Sue Williams Silverman Prize in Creative Nonfiction, Joy Rides Through the Tunnel of Grief. Jessica is the author of the memoir, If Only You People Could Follow Directions, which is a great title, which was selected as a best debut book by the Indies Introduced New Voices Program, the Indies Next List by the American Booksellers Association, and, and named a best book of the year by Kirkus Review. Her work has appeared in the anthology Bending Genre, edited by Nicole Walker and Margot Singer, as well as many other journals, including the Three Penny Review, Tin House, the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Carolina Quarterly, Columbia Journal, and Drunken Boat. She is Assistant Professor of Creative Writing at Virginia Commonwealth University and also teaches in the MFA program at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much, Chris. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for coming, everyone. It is a beautiful day and it's Eclipse Day. And so um, I think it's, it's actually uh, a tough day to, to sit inside for a lecture. So um, I will try to be entertaining. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, start by just thanking the HRC. I love this series. I love that the ways that, that we support uh, our faculty and our authors here at VCU. And I think it's really an honor to be included. I wanna thank Christina Stanchu for her invitation and Chris and Ronnie for doing all this work to, to host these events. Um, it's no small feat. And it's a, I think it's just a testament to the, the way that we are val valuing discourse. Um, and so today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about joy rides and I'm so, gonna sort of move between conversations about the process of this book, the process of writing and researching this book but also about uh, a creative nonfiction textbook that I was co-writing at the same time that I was working on Joy Rides. Um, and, I, and I'm doing that because I, these books are so interconnected to me, um, both just in their approach to creative nonfiction and the ways in which the craft language and the craft conversations I was having in that book were also happening in joy rides at the same time. So I was I was charged with um, producing with my friend and colleague Sean Prentice an advanced creative nonfiction textbook for Bloomsbury, and so we uh, we co-wrote this book, and that for me was just this really wonderful opportunity to take you know a, probably a decade of conversations about pedagogy that Sean and I had had, work that I had done in the classroom, 10 years of, you know, cobbling together, you know, a, a sort of textbook, a text for the course, um, and to codify that in my own language, to really think very deliberately about how I, you know, approach my work on the page, how I approach my work as a creative nonfiction writer, what I think about that, how I conceptually think about essays and how they are constructed and how I construct them. And so all of those conversations were happening at the same time that I was writing this book. And so um, for me, the title of this talk is, is, is a pretty significant one, you know, the interconnections. Um, 
Joy Rides is, as as Chris said, it's a it's a memoir and essays, and topically, it's about lost love. It's about uh, the loss of my relationship of fifteen years, my divorce. It's about lost identity, a lost sense of self, all of all of the things that come with the end of a long relationship. Um, but at its core, it's a working out of questions. It's a journey to understand something anew, which is really what essays are. They're a journey to understand something anew, and they are the record of that process. So in this book, I'm asking really big, significant questions, related questions about art making, about relationships, about the making of humans, about anticipatory grief. And I'm going to talk about those subjects a little bit in a moment. Um, but to, to me, this book is also as much about being a reader and writer of creative nonfiction as it is about anything else. Um, if I'm being really honest about process, which I'm trying to do and to and to sort of, you know, pull back the curtain and think through, well, how did I make this book? You know, I have to point to and highlight all of those interconnections. Um, and... I'm going to show you this book. This is the advanced creative nonfiction textbook that I was working on at the time. Um, and, I, you know, it's like any occupation. You know, who I am as a writer is indistinguishable from who I am as a person and how I see and move through the world. Um, creative nonfiction is essentially a, a, it's a it's a kind of being awake to the world that um, that, you know, translates onto the page. And I started writing this book um, almost a decade ago and joy rides. And I was newly married at the time to my partner. Like I said, at that time, we were together for 12 years. I was living in Vermont. I was far away from my family in Philadelphia. Um, we had been in Vermont for maybe five years at that point after a period of, of really moving around a lot. Um, and I was teaching at four different universities, one of which was Sarah Lawrence. So I was driving once a week, I would drive five hours down to New York, spend the night, wake up, teach a graduate class, one graduate class, um, and then, you know, drive five hours back to Vermont. So a lot of the writing of joy rides was done on the road. Uh, and, you know, that's just like kind of the work in your head that's happening all the time, but also, you know, leaving myself voice notes as I was driving back and forth and my relationships crumbling and, um, you know, some of the other concerns of this book that you can see on this slide, I tried to just, you know, highlight them for you, you know, was anticipatory grief, this experience uh, that I think if you have ever loved someone with uh, substance use disorder, you might be familiar with that feeling of um, that their death is always imminent. And, and, you know, he had been addicted to heroin for about 20 years at this point. And so, you know, that kind of high alert that you live through, you know, when when someone you know is is suffering like this is is pretty potent. Um, and they have a word for it, anticipatory grief, because it's a it's a pretty human and familiar experience. Um, so there was this kind of, you know, feeling of every phone call was going to be the phone call. Um, and I lived in constant fear of that. But I also lived in a kind of um you know, like the academic in me had a kind of intellectual curiosity about that. What does that mean to to experience anticipatory grief? And what is that? And I was, you know, doing all this research on anticipatory grief at the same time that this relationship was ending. And uh, being of an age, I was, I think, 32, 33, where I was really contemplating motherhood in a deliberate way for the first time in my life. And that came about because, you know, my husband, who uh, I was soon to be divorced from, um, had made it clear that he, uh, much to my surprise, did not want to have kids ever. And he was he was pretty uh, serious about that. So I had to to think through that. And because I am a writer of creative nonfiction, the way that I think through things often is is an essay. That's just how I I make sense of um, my world. So I was thinking about how I felt about that. It was, you know, I was thinking about my relationship to art making, to be, you know, someone who makes things, you know, art, and then potentially humans, a child. Um, and that 
you know, necessitated uh, thoughts about, you know, my relationship to my own mothers, you know, both my mother and then my grandmother and that lineage, lineage and our shared and inherited griefs. So I was also researching inherited grief, epigenetics. Um, as Jewish women, that's a pretty, you know, there's a, a kind of wormhole that you could go through to think about inherited grief. Um, the grief that I shared with my mother and grandmother that surrounded my brother, all of that, you know, was part of this conversation that was happening. Um, and then also, you know, the particular nature of the relationships I had with women, both my the women in my family, but also, you know, my best friend, this imagined daughter that shows up in this book. Um, and, you know, those intimacies, which were and still are the most powerful relationships of my life. And so at the same time, I remember meeting Sean, my co-author, you know, of the textbook at, you know, various coffee shops around Vermont to work on the textbook. And we would sort of swivel between conversations about craft and conversations about my crumbling marriage and feeling sort of simultaneously constricted and angry at the received ways that our culture co-signs intimacy in the form of marriage versus, say, the intimacies that I that I have with my female friends, but also, you know, the received forms of narrative that we were trying to explode in the textbook and that I was pushing against in my own creative work. So here you see my little Venn diagram that I made, um, you know, of these sort of topical concerns. But at the center of that um, was, was wonder. And, um, and that, that's sort of what was driving me, you know, that, that's, that felt like the center of what united all of these various concerns that I was thinking through in, in both of these books. So but, you know, that definition of wonder is a particular one, and it's one that I came to after a lot of research. And I'm going to read to you now. So I'm going to sort of move through readings from the books and this conversation. Um, this is in Joy Rides. And I'm going to read this, this part first, the part about wonder, and then go back to this idea of one body. Um, it, it makes more sense to read it this way. I think in the essay, it makes more sense the way it's organized here. But for the sake of our conversation, I'm going to switch it up a little. Wonder, which derives from the old English wundor, which may be cognate not only with the German wunder, but also with wound, which is cut, gash, wound. Wonder also means something that causes astonishment. So our first wound is also our first wonder. We are astonished by our cleaving. Atonitis in Latin thunderstruck. We are thunderstruck by the cleaving. I do not yet know that cleaving of one sort or another will happen again and again in this life, that pain is central to love. And that cleaving that I'm trying to identify is um, that the cleaving between mother and child, that first cleaving. And um, you experience that, you know, as, as a newborn, but you experience that as a mother too. And so uh, I use this term one body, one body. What I mean is that when the infant cleaves from her mother, a wound is created that she will spend <clears throat> a lifetime trying to fill. Their flesh, their flesh history is slowly erased, swallowed by a black hole of forgetting. Society demands it. Watching it go, the mother grieves and gasps. It is wounding, but also a wonder to watch herself slowly detach from herself, like a satellite released into orbit. Um, so this, this phrase, one body, I use it again and again in this book, and it becomes both a conceptual frame, um, but also a metaphor through which I'm looking at the relationship between mother and child as I'm contemplating the possibility of, of having my own child. Um, and how I came to this, you know, one body concept was really early in the book. So uh, there was a first sentence. And those of you who are writers, uh, if, if we're lucky, we get, you know, these sort of dropped from the heaven sentences every once in a while that will trouble you and puzzle you and, and maybe become part of something and maybe not. But um, this was this sentence, which isn't the first sentence of the book, 
ultimately, but it is the first sentence I wrote in this book, um, is one of those sentences. And I can see myself in the early process of writing this book, I can see where I came to the idea of one body as a way to think through the wound and the wonder of, of these relationships. And the sentence is, in the beginning, there is one woman. She is light and dark and warm and humming, and I do not know where her body ends and my begins. Um, and at the same time that this, this sentence sort of came to me, and I, I wrote it down, and it was in my notebook, and I was puzzling through it and um, trying to figure out what it might reveal to me at some point, I was getting these newsletters in my email box from Richard Rohr, who's a San Franciscan, he's a, a, a friar, he's a Catholic friar. And I'm not religious at all, um, but he also just writes about spirituality in a way that is, to me, um, uh, d has no bearing on, you know, it's not related to religion, um, but a spiritual connection to the world. And the quote is, in the beginning, and I just thought that was so striking because I was working through the sentence. And then, you know, this quote drops into my email box in the beginning, in the beginning, in our original unwoundedness, innocence, we live in an unconscious but real state of full connection. But I am afraid we must leave the garden. And usually around the age of seven, we increasingly think of ourselves as separate. This is the essential illusion that spirituality seeks to overcome. How do I get back to the garden of union and innocence? Objectively, I've never left, but it feels like I have. Um, so the, the confluence of those two ideas, the one that I was working through as someone who um, was suddenly presented with this conflict, which is, do I leave my partner who I loved very much, you know, 15 years, or do I, um, do I leave, you know, do I leave for the possibility of motherhood or do I stay in this relationship? you know, in this love that already exists. Um, but in that, in the confluence of those two things, the seed of something really significant was planted. This idea of full connection, I thought might mean God or, you know, why not? Like the mother as both a physical and emotional home. So one body becomes the way that I denote that home, that home in this book. Um, and then, so how that develops over the course of this book is also something that I was working through in the textbook at the time. And the way that we, this book is constructed is Sean and I would sort of trade off chapters and um, we would start each chapter with a personal vignette, some personal connection, either from our lives or from our work that would then demonstrate some of the craft that we, that we explicated in the, in the body of the chapter. And this chapter is the third chapter. It's called The Central Question, which my students are very familiar with at this point. Um, and, and it's a way that I think through essay making um, that I'll, and I'll describe that in more detail in a minute. But this vignette that I that I wrote to open this chapter is ultimately it's about an experience that does show up in in joy rides. But here in the textbook, I'm trying to use it to illustrate something about process and the concept of an essay's central question, which is like a, ki a kind of guiding concern that you work through as an essayist. Um, and, you know, something I, you know, I, I always, uh, you know, kind of uh, is, a, is a, a signpost for me as, a, as I'm trying to, to make an essay. So I'm going to read this vignette. And then I'm going to read the first bit of that chapter so you can sort of see how this might work out in a process way. One evening last summer, as the sky began to darken around nine o'clock, my husband and I heard a loud and persistent knocking on the front door. I got up to answer it, pulled back the curtain on the window, and saw an unfamiliar man swaying under the porch light. His hair was blue and his eyes were black. He looked to be in his mid twenties and probably drunk. He wore a pair of black leather unlaced combat boots. For a moment, we stared at one another through the glass. Where's Jane, he demanded. I told him I was sorry, but I didn't know a Jane. She wasn't here. 
Either he didn't hear me or he didn't believe me because he began to yell for her and jiggled the locked door handle. My husband came to the door and told the man to leave. Jane, the man said, Jane, I need to talk to you. He banged on the glass of the door so hard I thought it might shatter. I felt not so much afraid as curious. The man looked too drunk and slight to cause much harm. Even while his banging shook the windows and neighboring porch lights began to click on one by one across the street. Today had been a lovely day. I'd driven to Crassberry, Vermont for my home in Winooski about an hour each way to meet my writers group and then give a short reading of my work at the public library. The crowd had been small but interested. And after the reading, we gathered on the library's patio for cheese, fruit, and wine. In the distance, mountains ribbed the horizon. When I got home from the event, my husband had been in the garden, tending to his plants, while two young boys who lived next door pestered him for tomatoes and cucumbers, which he doled out generously. And yet, all day I felt uneasy. Beneath the day's placid veneer, my husband's recent confession, I don't think I want children after all, conflicted with the lush landscape, my friends' tender faces, and the inviting atmosphere at the library. So much beauty and possibility, but the sudden realization that I would not be able to have a child with the man I loved and had recently married graded against the contours of my consciousness. Memories from our decade as a couple beat inside me as I drove. As I'd crested the hill in Craftsbury, the landscape splayed in front of me like a lover. Terror and awe collided. I thought about the nonfiction book I was reading, Stendhal's Naples and Florence, a journey from Milan to Reggio, published in 1817, in which the author, who'd been enamored with the city of Florence for years before finally arriving to kneel before Giotto's frescoes in the Basilica of Santa Croce, writes, as I emerged from the porch of Santa Croce, I was seized with a fierce palpitation of the heart. The wellspring of life was dried up within me. And I walked in constant fear of falling to the ground. In the two centuries since the publication of Stendhal's travelogue, countless others have reported similar reactions to art. And it's not always art necessarily, but some other physical evidence of profound personal meaning. A temple in ruins, say, or Mother Teresa's profile on a piece of burnt toast. A plath poem, or the distant cry of a beluga whale off of the Aleutian coast. Reports consistently mention rapid heartbeat, fainting, even hallucinations. Some people lose their breath, consciousness or common sense. Loved ones are called and hospital visits are common. There are follow-ups with the shrink, prescriptions for Xanax. These days, these sorts of things, these days, these sorts of experiences have a name, Stendhal syndrome. It suggests that there are consequences for sneaking a peek of creation's billowing skirt, for fingering the tenuous threads of metaphor by the time this drunken man came banging on our door, he seemed to me like the embodiment of the day's wonder. By the time the cops arrived and escorted the man off of our front porch, I was already starting to formulate an essay in my mind. Um, so uh, I'm gonna pair that with a brief reading from the textbook itself um, and and in it, I'm I'm trying to sh sort of piece out how this idea of the question and the conflating experiences and Stendhal syndrome all relate from a process point of view. Almost daily, we hit on an issue, idea, or question that we can't let go, or we recall a complicated image and obsess over it. We linger over what confounds us, examining it, naming and renaming it, unraveling it, 
These obsessions compel us toward creating a story to explain this riddle we are trying to solve, since narratives are a primary tool for understanding. It is how we make sense of chaos. Find order out of disorder, seek, though we may not find, answers to questions. We explore obsessions not because we are experts with a point to argue, but because our voracious curiosity compels us to give form to wonder. Creative nonfiction, just like the issues we struggle with in our everyday lives, is compelled by what we do not know or understand. The writing process for creative nonfiction, therefore, is motivated by examining obsessions, which are articulated on the page as a central question. In other words, what and why we want to know about this image or idea or discovery or memory. Our first job as creative nonfiction writers, therefore, is to find questions that obsess and haunt us and that don't have an easy answer. The central question is the curiosity or set of curiosities that serve as a writer's motivation, inspiration, and compositional directive. So in other words, in, you know, in a different discipline, you might call this the hypothesis. I think the difference in creative nonfiction is that we don't typically come to any answers. Uh, but ideally, we do start to see things anew, to, to have a, a, a change of perspective. Um, so, you know, as I'm trying in this vignette, I'm trying to understand those emotional and intellectual relationships between this day, this single day in Crassbury, Vermont, what I was reading in Stendhal's work, what I was working through with my husband, and then this experience of this man just showing up on our doorstep um, looking for someone who wasn't there. And I didn't know how those things connected, but I had a kind of intuition that they were connected beyond just, you know, happen having to happening to take place on the same day. Um, and, you know, by the way, that's a really vulnerable place to write from. And that's part of what I love about creative nonfiction. So I just I want to take just a minute to reflect on that a bit about how the process of writing creative nonfiction from ignorance and vulnerability toward discovery through this explicit unpacking of our most private emotional, spiritual and intellectual inquiries is both art and a way of being in the world. Um, by which I mean, you know, this this real curiosity and openness and the ways that the CNF writer has to resist you know, the dominant cultural bent towards shame and silence um, and to do that with all of our psychic wounds kind of laid bare on the page. Um, you know, we, Western culture in particular, you know, suffers from a fear of vulnerability. And I think that our culture has defined vulnerability as a weakness. Um, and that's actually, it requires tremendous strength and power. And I think that's why it scares us. It threatens the status quo. Um, but nonfiction is where writers are able to be both vulnerable and to make sense of their vulnerability. And I think that's what I love so much about it. One of the things that I tell my students sometimes when I teach nonfiction and something that I've really had to tell myself uh, when writing this book in particular is that you have to rip the Band-Aid off. You have to look at the wound for what it is. And, you know, the genre of memoir, as hard as it sounds, really thrives on suffering and it lives on vulnerability, which, of course, means it's also capable of the kind of rewiring that we produce through prolonged therapy, um, but also includes this other imperative, which is to make meaning, to make an experience meaningful to someone else, to create a piece of art through which someone else can access their most vulnerable questions. Um, being a, a reader and writer of creative nonfiction is for me about being in community in this really powerful and essential way. Um, and, you know, the conversations we're having when we read and when we write through personal experience are, are revelatory. Um, there's an intimacy that's created that we don't necessarily get to have, uh, in our everyday lives, um. And I don't think that there's any other medium that fosters that kind of intimacy between strangers 
Um, and that's so that's so powerful. Um, you know, other other forms of writing, other forms of art, of course, create this intimacy. But there's something about the vulnerability required of creative nonfiction, the laying bare of the wound, and then the working through that that I think is particular to to the genre. Um, but that's also, I think, you know, a part of why memoir is is sometimes misunderstood. Um, especially by those of us who are really susceptible to to patriarchy's delusions. So, I mean, just to think literally, you know, we think about the the alleged insult of navel gazing, right? I think that's a charge some memoir writers have and something I, you know, is is really important for me to, to push back against with my students when I'm teaching creative nonfiction. Um, and what a misunderstanding that is. I mean, imagine writing about your belly button, you know, that small, really seemingly insignificant place on your body. And then consider looking at one's belly button and and not only its connection to one's mother, but then that that body's first interaction with, with civic infrastructure. And uh, because I've recently become a mother, I can tell you that to give birth to a child in this country is to immediately confront all of our biggest civic failures in one foul swoop, you know, healthcare, childcare, capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's all like right in your fat face in this really um, emotional way too, um, because you've just given birth to this child. So to imagine that writing about oneself is not also writing about these larger systemic inheritances is simply untrue. It's wrong. Um, so the writer's job is to to make visible those structures which might otherwise go unseen. We live in a world of interconnection, but we exist in a society that often tries to isolate us into these discrete boxes, silos of class, career, gender, politics, to make us forget maybe that all of the money that our government is spending on war is money that isn't being sent on spent on education, for example, um, or childcare. Um, and so the writer's imperative, and particularly the CNF writer's imperative, is to illuminate the linkages between us and to the histories that we all carry, not as a mode of teaching the reader facts, but as a way of helping us see our own lives in relationship to the world, you know, our bodies in union with the world. Um, and so witnessing a memoir's vulnerability on the page makes space for that interrogation of our own, our own lives and the political imperatives of, of a writing that sw swivels between self and world, not as a means of dwelling on the self, but as a mode of almost diluting the self, contextualizing it, tracing its wires back to the environmental, socio-political, and cultural roots. Um, so, you know, one of the other things I kind of think about a lot is, you know, that really permeates our culture is that when you write memoir, you're putting an experience to bed, so to speak, you know, but good memoir blows that experience wide open. And that is the, it's the wound in wonder that, that I'm writing about both in Joy Rides, but also in the textbook. There's really no closing of the door. You actually have to open that door really wide open and you're there and, and you're like, come on in. You're inviting other people to come in with you. Um, and that's, that's the power. That's the invitation for people to come in to bear witness. Um, so, you know, there's no such thing as, as closure. Um, there's only like, how do I rewire the emotional map in my brain so that I can survive this thing? And that creation, creative nonfiction has therapeutic effects is not its failure. It's actually, it's, it's superpower. Um, which which brings me again to something I, I try to tell my students, like when you write creative nonfiction, you quite literally rearrange the neural networks in your brain. Um, I was having a lunch with a colleague of mine the other day, and she was reading a book about the science of grief and talking about the way that, you know, grief is, is particularly difficult because, because we have this emotional neural network that puts somebody we love in place in our brain. And so when we go through the grief, that whole emotional map, she called them object traces, is, is upended. And so we have to create a new one. Um, so, you know, when you can do that on the page, it also is a kind of, I mean, both as a reader and a writer, <clears throat> excuse me, like what magic is that? Like what a wonder is that, that you can actually rearrange that neural network. Um, 
So in this book, I, I broke a lot of the rules that I, you know, that I often tell students and, and chief among them was something that I've talked about for years and a spouse for years that you have to have some sort of emotional distance from the experience in order to write about it well. And, I, you know, in some ways I still stand by that. But I think when my divorce happened and I was right in the middle of writing this book and this relationship was central to this book. So everything about the book had to change. And suddenly, you know, there's nothing else I can think about except my heartbreak, you know, which is the way of heartbreak. And um, so I knew everything about the book had to change. You know, it upended everything I thought I was writing about. But I didn't want to wait five years for emotional distance to reveal its truths. So the nature of a trauma like heartbreak is that it rocks your real, you know, your your core, your identity. Um, and I don't think you can have a kind of emotional distance distance once once you've experienced that. So I started to wonder, like, what is a book written in media rest in the middle? And that became a, a craft question for me. How would writing from the middle impact form, style, voice? Like, what would I discover from the, mi the middle of things that maybe wouldn't be accessible in five years or 10 years? And is there a truth there, too, in the heat of things that will, of course, change over time, you know, my relationship to the experience and the truths therein will change and have changed. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean necessarily that the truths in immediacy are any less true. They're just, they're just different truths. So um, that became a kind of project, you know, of this book, a craft question that, that I really took up in this book. Um, I want to just point to, this is one of my favorite definitions of, of memoir. Um, and uh, it comes from John Degada's essay, Mare Mare, an essay about how I wish we wrote our nonfictions. Um, embedded in Latin's memoria is the ancient Greek memeros, an offshoot of the Avestic Persian mermara, itself a branch of the Indo-European root for all that we think about but cannot grasp. Mare Mare, to vividly worry to be anxious about, to exhaustively ponder. In the genuinely dusky light of a real human memory, there is an activity far less sure of itself than the effortlessly recounted stories of today's sculpted memoirs. According to its roots, in other words, memoir is an essaying of ideas, images, and feelings. It is, in the best sense, an impulsive exploration. It is not storytelling. It is not moralizing. It is not knowing, learning, or owning. Rather, etymologically speaking, at the core of every memoir is anxiety and wonder and doubt. Um, so I just, you know, notice the emphasis on, on interiority, like to exhaustively ponder or in a saying of ideas and images. Um, there's another writer, David Lazar, and he argues in an essay about creative nonfiction that memory is always in constant friction with present desire. And yet what we find in a lot of American memoirs are memory-based prose organized chronologically or in that same inverted bell curve that has dominated Western literature for centuries, as opposed to, say, prose organized by the way that the mind moves or by the body circuit circuitry or by emotional awakening. And, you know, what might that look like? So there's a need always for new forms. And that's what I was pushing towards both in joy rides and in this idea of like, what is a book written in media res, um, but also in the textbook too. So that's just another way that this book joy rides is as much about the craft of writing as it is about the living. I was interested in crafting sentences and forms and resisting those really familiar received forms as I was about any of the content in this book. And in a perhaps maybe similar way that my interest in this imagined child who shows up again and again in this book was a much about was as much about the process of making her and I don't, I don't mean that biologically but intellectually and emotionally making her um as the her that I had dreamed up. Um, so I'm going to close today. I'm going to read a final excerpt from my book. And it's it's actually the last few pages of the prologue. But most of the writing done in this section was done last. Um, and so in it, I think 
you know, I'm, I'm trying really to articulate what this project was all about for me. And I can hear myself rereading it. I can hear myself making that final turn near the end, the one that, you know, ultimately deposits me in a new place than the one where I had started in the beginning. Um, so I'm going to read this excerpt and then I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I was 31 when I started this book. Jack had just confessed that he didn't want to have children, not with me or anyone ever. We were newly engaged. I did not know what to do, so I did what I knew how to do. I thought maybe I could write my way through big questions about the nature of creation. I thought I could discover something grand and unifying, something essential about what it means to be a woman, an artist, and a mother. Could I make art instead of children? Would that satisfy the creative imperative I felt beating itself out inside me like a wild hare? And what, what of the choke of death? How could I be a woman, an artist, and a mother under the specter of my brother's imminent death? With what fortitude? What feral instinct? Why did I get to live this life while he merely suffered it? I did not find those answers in this book. During the long, dark hours of my divorce, a couple years after Jack's confession, I looked at one painting by Mary Pratt more than the others. I should say that um, earlier in the prologue, I, I was talking about looking at the work of Mary Pratt, which I just so happen to have that book right here because I keep it with me all the time. But anyway, um, Mary Pratt is a Canadian painter, was a Canadian painter um, and someone that for whatever reason, I turned I turned to her work a lot during this, this time period. I looked at one painting by Mary Pratt more than the others, Service Station, 1978. I crossed it like an ocean, caressed it like a lover. It made me angry in ways I could not articulate. While much of Pratt's work, however lauded, has come to represent the supposed steady quietness of a woman's domestic life, as if such a thing exists. There are darker undercurrents. It is not the sumptuousness of the chocolate cake that impresses me, but the salient edge of the silver blade beside it in Chocolate Birthday Cake, 1997. It is not the simplicity and directness of eggs in an egg crate, 1975, nor even the radiant light and translucency that Pratt creates but the striking emptiness of those six jagged, broken shells that compel me, their delicate insides spilling out like so much spent fertility. Here is someone who knows something about what it means to be a woman, an artist, and a mother. Could I make art instead of children? Would that satisfy the creative imperative I felt? Um. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Service Station, 1978. This is the painting here um, that I'm referring to. Uh, the light is a sickly green and the carcass is an empty coat of glistening muscle and wet curving ribs. The hooves are spread and wide and pointed to the ceiling. There is no doubt that the image is violent, ferocious, feminine. Blood splatters the cardboard scattered across the floor and smears the truck's bumper. The source images came from her friend, Ed Williams, a mechanic in Salmonier, Canada. The images he gave her initially confounded Pratt. She held on to them for years before making the painting. In that time, her infant son died, when only a day old, preceded by his twin while still in the womb. Her son, John, suffered a brief but harrowing brush with cancer. I got through that, and then I said to myself, you can do this now, Pratt said, referencing the image of the splayed moose. You know what this is about. My life changed drastically between when I started this book and ended it. Not just my personal life, but everything. The world grew hotter and caught fire. A pandemic decimated the population. A million horrors befell us. A million mitzvahs too. Tides have dressed and undressed our shores over and again. I adapted, revised, rewrote. At one point I realized I no longer knew what the book was about. 
The composition was all wrong. I nearly tossed it. I envied Pratt's certainty. This was the source of my defeat. I never knew what any book I wrote was about. The question always befuddled me. How was I to take this great swath of experience, ideas, feelings, and forms, only to pluck out a few choice words and say this? This is what this book is about. As if we could say the same of a life. I could not finally declare big truths, even though I felt them in my body, strokes of light where once there beat a heart. But what if the creative imperative is not about creating anything, but instead beckoning forth what's already there? breaking open our brittle chests to lay hands on the wreckage, tender the red, wet wound. Essayist Mary Capella writes, instead of writing about, as in what is your book about, creative nonfiction writes from, or nearby, or toward, under, around, through, and so on. I think she means we need more specific verbs with which to calculate the problems of language and love. This is a book from wonder. It is a book amid women, inside anticipatory grief, through our mothers and toward something substantial. This is one book under love. It is in pursuit of the creative imper imperative. When Pratt's old friend, Ed Williams, finally saw the painting that had taken her so many years to me, he studied it for a long time, shook his head, grinned and said, well, well, there's my old truck. I laughed when I read that because, of course, of all the things the painting is about, it's also about that or through or aside or against everything it conjures in the viewer. The meaning is a third space over which neither the maker nor the beholder has complete dominion. It's in the collision of their distinct perceptions, the center of a Venn diagram, its own thing. It is as much a painting about Ed Williams's old truck and everything that image evokes in him as it is about anything else. Pratt's tremulous grief, for instance. Love is discourse. It is relational. Maybe this is why we persist in pouring love into third spaces, children, art, intoxicants like sex and drugs. It's only there that it seems to make any sense there outside the self, there where we can look at it together and marvel, our twined love mixing together and apart like paint in a bucket of water, like a pattern that won't keep still, refuses to be solved, but holds us wrapped anyway, like a witch's gaze, like a new spring, letting down her hair, like the splayed ribs of a dead moose, like your old truck. Um, so thank you. I uh, will stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Sure. Um, we're going to open the floor up now for questions. And as a reminder, you can post your questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll also, um, I'll also read them out loud and then Jessica can, can respond. Um, so we have one in the um, chat from Shannon um, Robertson. Does VCU offer online CNF courses? Oh. <laughs> It does actually, and I am teaching. Well, you know, on occasion we do, but um, Shannon, I'm teaching one this summer actually, a five week online course. It's online asynchronous. Um, and so, anyway, you can contact the English department if you're interested in that. Great. Um, okay, so lots of not nuts and bolts questions. Lauren Peters asks Speaking of community, any recommendations for groups, places, spaces of writers in Richmond? Yeah, um, so there is the James River Writers Coalition. I think that's what they're called. Um, I, I know about them. There's another group too, and maybe I could, set, Lauren, um, I could probably email this to you, but there's a, a a young woman who started a writers group who recently reached out to me and and wanted to um, to try to solicit some some students who might be interested in a writers group. So. Um, I know about those, but, you know, you could always, I remember when I first moved to Vermont and I knew no one, there was a website called meetup.com. I don't know if that exists anymore, but I know there's like next door neighbor and all these like community forums where I would just post, you know, Hey, I'm a writer. I'm looking for, you know, people who are interested in having these conversations. And I think you'll be surprised by, by how many people might respond to that. 
Thank you. Um, Trey um, Bernard Hall writes, thank you for writing such a vulnerable and insightful book. It is extremely innovative with form and style in a deeply personal way. You created tropes and stylistic themes throughout the book, such as when there would be a contemplation or an internal thought that is then directly echoed in dialogue. This created a poetic repetition, but also mimicked the interaction between thought and speech. Did these moments and others like it occur naturally through your written voice or were they a product of deep revision? Hmm. That's probably a combination of the two. Um, but, you know, I was part of this was, you know, the questions that I had about voice, like how would, you know, once I started to revise this book from the beginning and, you know, when I, the, you know, the sort of rupture happened in my relationship and I realized I had to revise this book. Um, I had never written anything from such a close emotional distance. And so I think some of that is the product, like the answer to my question, which is how does voice impact, how is voice impacted when we're writing from the middle? Um, and part of that is like those, that kind of call and response that's happening both internally and then like in your world, because you're living it at the same time. So um, I think that's something that I, you know, I, I probably found along the way as I was, as I was trying to sort of capture immediacy, the immediacy and, and the truth in the moment. Um, but then, you know, probably, which is what usually happens when I'm drafting and revising an essay, you know, you start to notice things that at first might be subconscious or unintentional, and you see that there's something interesting happening. And then you start to, you start to see what would happen if you were more deliberate about that. Um, Mary Kate and Lingold um, comments. Thank you, Jess. Wonderful talk. I'm curious how the experience of motherhood has changed your thinking about some of the subject matter from the book. Oh my God. <laughs> That's such a, such a big question. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, everything's changed, right? I mean, that's the, that's, that's the beauty of it, I think. Um, and how that is all changed. I think I'm still working through my daughter's only 11 months old and, and these early days are, are like a, such a shock to the system. Um, but, you know, I want I, I guess the biggest thing that I have realized about the way that I was working through these questions in the book um, is I, you know, they were, they were intellectual questions. They were emotional questions, but they were, because I did not have this child, they could remain somewhat abstract, which meant I could work through them um, in a way that was hypothetical and therefore removed. And then, you know, and so it's not that those questions, you know, the kind of questions I was asking about motherhood and making, it's not that they, um, you know, were negated by, by having my daughter or, you know, beside the point, but they're suddenly so much more visceral and emotional because there's this human child, there's this connection with her. And so the nature of the way that I was thinking through them, I couldn't do again. You know, I couldn't, uh, you know, when and if I I write about motherhood, um, you know, I will have a completely different set of questions because that that visceral connection is something that I can't undo. I can't unhave, you know, and and so I guess I'm looking forward to maybe a time in my motherhood where I can feel a little, a little less removed, but right now our remake, our relationship is so, um, you know, we haven't, we haven't severed yet. <laughs> the cleaving hasn't taken place, you know, we're still, we're still one body. And I, I, I want to stay in that space right now. <laughs> 